Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back. Uh, so this afternoon, you have uh, two lectures on applications of small angle neutron scattering. Uh, so I'll be giving uh, the first one, and I believe it's Judith Houston who's giving the second one. So my examples are going to focus on some aspects of what I touched on um, in uh, my lecture yesterday on magnetic small angle neutron scattering. Uh, so, um, and what we're going to look at is we're going to spend some time talking about some examples relating to diffraction at small angles. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, using a field to control the signal and exploring the role of anisotropy and other factors in the diffuse small angle neutron scattering signal. So that's the plan uh, for today. And um, as a part of that, I will also be raising some other issues that can come up during um, experiments. So we'll start off with uh, uh, some examples of diffraction at small angles. Um, so um, I will start off with an illustration using vortex lattices in superconductors. I'll do that because that's something I do quite a bit. Um, but I will also give some other examples, including some non-magnetic ones. And then uh, we will use this as a way to illustrate the differences between pulsed and continuous sources. And then um, I'll highlight uh, some problems that may arise um, that uh, one needs to think about a little bit. And as I said before, if you have any questions, please interrupt or type them into the chat. Um, okay. So uh, there are a few to use this uh, demonstration of vortex lattices and superconductors. There are a small number of things uh, that you need to know, not too much. Um, about vortex lattices and superconductors. Basically, a superconductor, um, uh, as you may know, has zero resistance um, at, when it's inside the superconducting state, and it expels magnetic field. This is something called the Meissner effect. Um, and this is what uh, you may have seen various demonstrations of at various points. However, in some superconductors, uh, in most actually, um, above a certain critical field, um, you end up with the small regions of normal state, which are called flux lines, entering into the superconductor and they lie parallel to the magnetic field. So this is supposed to be an illustration. You can think of them as tubes or pencils stacked parallel to the direction in which you apply the magnetic field. Um, and uh, so uh, as, with, as when you stack pencils together, you will normally get some sort of close packed lattice, which may be hexagonal in nature. Um, and uh, one of the uh, useful things about these is that uh, they have a fixed amount of magnetic flux in them. And so that means that as a function of the applied magnetic field, you can work out exactly how far apart they must be. Um, and so it turns out that the distances between these objects fits perfectly into the small angle neutron diffraction range. Um, and uh, the objects are uh, generally straight. They are monodisperse. And so they are um, uh, uh, a good example for looking at the um, looking at diffraction in this in this range. So uh, this is um, a sketch of the standard uh, monochromatic type of small angle instrument. So we have our neutrons coming in and then we have our detector here. And then we have our superconductor sample with these, with these flux lines or vortices inside it. Um, and basically the geometry that we're adopting here um, is that uh, we have our, our lattices, our vortices set up and they are arranged in a particular pattern. And then we basically um, uh, have them aligned parallel to the field. And then if we rotate, if we rotate the field by a very, very small angle, then we will end up in the Bragg diffraction, the Bragg condition for scattering off the planes, the, the arrangements of vortices. Um, so that's the, that's the geometry. So this is easiest if the field is basically nearly parallel to the neutron beam. So you start off with the field parallel to the neutron beam and you rotate slightly to meet the Bragg diffraction condition. And this is the usual geometry for studies of vortex lattices and also for magnetic skirmions, um, which behave in a very similar way. Um, 
And this is not the type of geometry you would use with the magnetic field necessarily when looking at other magnetic materials, um, but in this case, it's the right one. So, uh, there we go. So if you want to um, basically measure something uh, measure a Bragg peak, then just as you would on, on an ordinary diffractometer, what you want to do is you want to try to capture that reflection completely. And the way that we usually do that is by a rocking curve. So um, effectively, we have a rotation axis as indicated here. So we have the sample sitting here and we rotate and the beam would be coming into the, into the screen. And then we rotate about that axis. Um, and uh, the video that you can see here is taken from uh, niobium. So niobium is, uh, is, uh, is the favorite material for looking at uh, these vortex lattices because it scatters extremely strongly. Um, and indeed, it's actually used to check the alignment of, uh, of fields in magnets to check that uh, one knows exactly how the magnets, how the axis of the field is oriented with respect to the external markers on the magnet, because basically it's uh, uh, the, the, the vortices lie directly parallel to the field. And so what you can see on here is we've got our detector, our small angle, our standard detector. And then as we rotate the sample, we bring some of these spots into the diffraction condition and then they move out. So the center of the beam would be here and you can see these spots coming in and out. Um, and uh, basically what we then do is we, uh, if you imagine, if we concentrate on this spot here, we put a box around this particular region of the detector, and then we measure all of the intensity in that box as a function of the angle that we've changed. And if we do that, then we will end up being able to construct peaks that look like this. So we have uh, the box that I would, the imaginary box I was drawing was here, and that would correspond to this green, the, this green peak. And then if I were to draw a box around, say this one, then I would get this orange peak, for example. Um, and so that's how I make my measurement. Um, and then I can use this information to infer some uh, of the behavior of the, uh, some of the properties of the uh, niobium. So uh, if I want to extract quantitative data, then I take these rocking curves. If I want to make nice pictures, then I should sum over all of the rocking curves. Um, and then I will get a summed picture that allows me to see all of the individual features. So this is the sum of the video that you just saw. So we have the center of the beam here, and then we can see our first order diffraction spots, second order diffraction spots, and uh, et cetera. And, uh, this is obviously a picture in reciprocal space. Um, so the real space orientation in this case is the same shape, but rotated by 90 degrees about, um, uh, rotated, uh, this shouldn't say B axis, rotated 90 degrees um, in, the, in the plane of the, yes, oh no, about the B axis. So that, uh, so that um, uh, basically this spot would be up here and this spot, the, this spot would be the here, or rather the flex lines that would correspond to those spacings would be in those, in those positions. Okay, so one thing to note here, um, and we'll come back to this in a moment, is to think about the effects of gravity. Uh, so um, in this type of instrument, you may often have a very long distance between the sample and the detector and for that matter, between uh, the velocity selector and the sample. And uh, the neutrons, uh, they're traveling very fast, but uh, they are not traveling fast enough that we cannot see uh, the, the effects of gravity. So basically over this long path length, you will start to see that, uh, that some, of the, some of the spots, they, they basically droop. Um, and this, uh, this drooping effect is due to the, uh, some of the neutrons um, uh, uh, they acquire a certain, uh, they, they basically move down in the, in the y direction. So they move downwards because they're basically following a parabola. Um, and that parabola uh, starts somewhere back here and then they are basically moving down a bit. So uh, as you move your detector further and further away, you may need to correct for this kind of thing. 
it's very obvious when you are looking at these spots. Um, and it's also obvious if you pay attention to the position of the beam center as you move further out. Um, but obviously this would also happen if you're looking at something that's nominally cylindrically symmetric and you may end up uh, not quite seeing is it cylindrically symmetric um, in this case. Okay. So one of the very nice things about small angle scattering when you use it for diffraction purposes is that you really can, uh, it, it makes it very easy to get your data out in absolute units, which can be, which can be very helpful. So this is a, a key strength in neutron scattering in general. Um, and so I will use the example of these vortex lattices to illustrate to this. So basically we try to measure the, the direct beam and use that to normalize our, our results so that we can then um, basically extract um, actual field, but actual values for the, for the magnetic fields that are causing the distortions inside these, inside these materials. So for vortex lattices, uh, this is done via something called the Christen formula, which is in this box here. And, uh, but so one can do similar things for other features such as skirmions, for example. And uh, in this formula, we've got the integrated intensity that we've measured at a particular spot. So that's taking the area under, say, this green spot. We've got the uh, intensity of the beam. So this is the, uh, this is the direct beam. Um, so one does that by basically removing any beam stops and then measuring uh, uh, measuring uh, the total the, the uh, total intensity in the central in the central spot, and then we have things like the wavelength of the neutrons, the thickness of the sample, um, gamma, which is this one point point nine one factor that came up in the uh, lecture yesterday. I didn't highlight it particularly, but it's relating to the gyromagnetic ratio of the neutron. Um, we've got our flux quantum, which is basically the amount of flux each of these vortex lattices hold the associated wave vector, and then this quantity F, which is actually the quantity that we can then compare, that we want to extract. And this is basically the Fourier component of the spatial variation of field inside our vortex lattice. So you can think of this as being basically related to the, to the size of the change in the, in the magnetic field in the flux lattice and in the bulk of the superconductor. Um, and so typically, uh, of the value of this uh, of this form factor will be of about the order of eight gauss. And so that is something that we can detect. And if we do our normalizations properly, then we can extract actual values of this field in reproducible as a reproducible quantity. So uh, that's an example of what you can do if you're looking at vortex lattices. Uh, and what I've said there applies to uh, applies to uh, other types of uh, other types of material. Um, and so the question then is what sort of periodic structures will exist on these length scales? Well, we may have chemical structures with very large unit cells. We could have ordered arrays of large length scale objects. And we could also have uh, magnetic superstructures. Um, and uh, this is just a, a picture that uh, prepared by um, uh, prepared by, I've forgotten her first name, um, Edla, the University of Bath. Um, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, where it shows different uh, different scales of, uh, of objects and also gives some in, in, indication of different techniques that are well suited. So we're basically focusing on things that may occur in this particular region. Um, and sometimes some of these other objects will fall into fall into these into these areas. So to give a, an example of uh, something like small angle diffraction in a different uh, context, Karen, that's it, Karen Edler, um, then uh, what we can, uh, we can consider basically things like liquid crystal that are behaving in a, a little bit like liquid crystal uh, material. So these are actually my cells um, and basically they're disordered. So you see nothing. And then at some point, uh, we get some orientational order on the application of shear in this particular case. And then because there is some, uh, some order, um, they're basically all oriented in this particular direction and we have some characteristic length between them, then we see a, a, a pattern like this. 
And um, depending on how ordered this is, this may get closer to a true Bragg peak, but we can still extract information on the separation from that. And then eventually, as you apply more shear in this case, you get it going to an isotropic case. Um, but uh, if you want to examine these features here, you can do the same type of rocking as I just described. Um, yes. And so um, other examples of this type of behavior would be in certain types of liquid crystals as you move through the transitions in, uh, in liquid crystals. Okay. In terms of uh, long range chemical structures and long range magnetic superstructures, this obviously depends on the specifics of uh, the particular material. So I've picked um, an example here. So this is the, uh, this is the chemical structure for, uh, well, this is an example from the family of uh, hexaferrites. Um, so basically, as you can see, these are, these are materials containing iron um, and oxygen, hence the ferrite. Um, and then, uh, then you have something out the front here, which could just be the, the original one of these is barium with nothing else, and then the iron and the oxygen. Um, and uh, these, uh, these materials basically uh, have a very, very long repeat length along the C direction. And so what, uh, what this, uh, this region here represents one unit cell of this material. And as you can see, um, there are a lot of things stacked up, stacked up the C axis. Um, and uh, the thing to focus on to try to make sense of this particular picture is say if you concentrate on the blue atoms, which represent the ions or the magnesiums in this particular case. Um, and so you can see here that we have a, a diagonal component, a vertical component, a diagonal component, a vertical component, etc., repeating up until we get to the point of the repeat. So this has a, a large, uh, a pretty large unit cell, and um, it contains iron, and the iron has a uh, carries a magnetic moment, and in fact it, it can develop a very complicated magnetic structure, which is supposed to be illustrated. Uh, by the bits here to the right. So basically the irons carry the magnetic moment and uh, they are split into different types of uh, behavior. So you can see here that it's written L3, S3, etc. cetera. Um, so the L3 is referring to, uh, to this diagonal component and it has a, a large moment on this uh, kind of larger cone here pointing upwards. And then the vertical parts are uh, classified as S3, and then it points downwards in this case. And so over the whole of this unit cell, we build up a rather complicated magnetic structure. And that leads with an with a even longer repeat distance than the chemical structure. And this, uh, this particular example will fall into the range of what we can see um, using small angle neutron scattering. Um, and so this is an example. Um, from a material like that. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of the detector at D33 um, at the Institut Lauer Langevin. So this is a, a small angle neutron scattering instrument where you can take the detector to be uh, about 13 meters away from the sample. And it is equipped with a central detector, but also with four side detectors. Um, and uh, basically the uh, magnetic reflection, the large magnetic superstructure in this case is, uh, is shown here. Um, and uh, so the software that was used to prepare this particular picture is a software called GRASP, which is, uh, well, it can do, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't do the same kinds of things. It's not optimized for the same kinds of things as SASView, um, but it is optimized for basically looking at uh, looking at uh, magnetic reflections and considering how, well, at reflections, Bragg reflections, and considering how they change as a function of applied angle. And so in this case, you can see that there are several little boxes, and these are the regions that are being integrated over to construct um, the uh, rocking curves to extract integrated intensity um, in the way that I was telling you about earlier for the, for the vortex lattice. Um, one other thing to notice here is that you can see some features. Uh, it looks like a circle, sort of, associated around here. Um, and so I believe that in this case, this circle here represents the detector window. So um, 
you have uh, your sample before the window to the detector tank, and that has a particular size. And in this case, our detectors were placed in such a way that some parts of the detector would never receive any neutrons because, uh, because the, the neutron beam had to go through a whole load of the, the tank instead of through the window to get in. So that's another thing to be aware of when setting up, setting up your particular experiment. OK. So um, I also wanted to use this to give a, an illustration of the difference between time of flight and monochromatic measurements. So the layout of the instrument that I showed you before, this one here is for the monochromatic uh, measurement. And here you set the wavelength for one measurement, given that you have a spread of wavelengths, but you have a central, you have a central wavelength and a relatively small spread. And to look at a particular momentum transfer, then you just move the detector backwards and forwards, and you may play with the collimation to um, alter the beam divergence, um, as is most optimal for your experiment. If you're using a time of flight sand spectrometer, then in this case, typically um, the detector is fixed. So the example that I've taken here is Taycan at J Park. Uh, so the detector is fixed, and you have multiple detectors, actually, um, to cover different angles. And uh, then um, you basically, in your experiment, you are measuring multiple wavelengths at the same time. And it is the spread of the wavelengths that sets the momentum transfer range that you can access. So uh, in the end, we're trying to get to the same quantities. Um, but here we change the uh, move the detector distance to set the Q range. And here we play with the wavelength to set the Q range. Ah, OK. Um, and that's just a, a photo of uh, D33, the instrument I mentioned, and its neighbor D11, where this tank is, I think, 40 meters long. That's very large. OK, so if I'm looking at uh, Bragg diffraction peaks, then uh, I already um, showed you this video uh, for the uh, measuring um, niobium, measuring the flux line lattice in niobium. And uh, so we rotated the sample to get into the Bragg reflection condition for various peaks. Now, if we're doing our time of flight measurement, then um, in principle, we can set our sample at a, particular at a particular angle, so not necessarily straight on, but slightly off. Um, and then we're using the different wavelengths to construct information about the peak. And so here, this is uh, basically one measurement. Um, but what is changing between the different frames in this video is that we are looking at different wavelength bins. So the spot that you can see here is a spot from um, a skirmion lattice. And you can see that it's moving across the detector. And that is not because the Q is changing, but because the wavelength is changing. So the spot always appears at the same Q. Um, but we are able to pick up, uh, pick up the spot at different wavelength values. And so if we're careful, then we can convert uh, we can end up with the same information um, as we would get from this. So eventually, the information that we want to know is the uh, relative intensity or the absolute intensity of a given reflection. And in this case, we can look at it in the way that I showed you before. We, we change the angles and then we sum over the intensities. And in this case, we are looking at the intensity at different wavelengths and using that in a similar way to extract information. Now, typically, you should probably measure at a couple of different angles to get sufficient information here. Um, but you can get quite a lot of information from one, uh, from one angle position. And uh, you can also see that early on, at small, at, um, there was a spot appearing here, so some kind of spurious spot that only appears at a certain point. And that is probably uh, something, some scattering, uh, some Bragg scattering from uh, the window, I would have guessed. If the windows are made of silicon, then you can get uh, then you can get sharp Bragg peaks appearing at certain at certain times. Okay, so that is a kind of illustration of the difference, and uh, hopefully it uh, gives you an idea of the kind of things you need to uh, be aware of uh, when considering the differences between what you're measuring in the monochromatic case and in the time of flight case.
Okay, so I also said that I would say something about unexpected problems. Uh, so um, I showed you this picture before and I commented on the effect of um, gravity. Um, and so uh, although this is something that one just has to correct for in our experiment, in the kind of experiments that I do, um, it can be an opportunity. And so being able to see that you have this effect actually motivated uh, some uh, experiments um, to try to see if, uh, if, uh, if when you created a gravitational potential well for the neutrons to exist in, that you would also be able to get, that you might also be able to see quantized states um, and uh, so an experiment was set up. This has nothing to do with the small angle neutron scattering part, but it was motivated, I would say, in part by the original observation of the effects of gravity. So the idea is that the neutrons come in, they reflect off a mirror, there's an absorber, um, and then you end up basically with the neutrons sitting at particular positions, which are quantized, quantized heights, let's say, um, so that we can indeed see bound quantum states in a gravitational potential well. Um, and this is... Uh, this is the kind of key plot where you see that uh, you're getting neutrons um, like so in these kinds of steps. So it's just something a little bit different. Right, I'm going to move on to the next section, but if you have any questions, now would be a, <coughs> a good time to ask. Okay. So uh, we're now going to look at uh, the case of uh, these two cases, using a field to control the signal and exploring the role of anisotropy and other factors. So um, I'm just going to start by thinking about the effects of alignment in a ferromagnet. So if we have a real ferromagnet, then we have these magnetic domains, as we talked about a little bit yesterday, and they form these closure circles to reduce stray fields in general. And as illustrated here, we go from having many stray fields to a little bit of stray field to hardly any stray field. Um, and so, and the, the boundaries be, between, these, uh, between these domains, we have the domain walls, which in this picture are drawn as straight line, as, uh, as thin lines. But as you may recall from yesterday, they have a particular length. Um, and the, that length is set by the, uh, um, uh, the exchange interaction between the between the, the magnetic moments in this material amongst other considerations. Okay. And so as we increase our magnetic field, then we will end up getting closer and closer to a saturation magnetization. And so supposing we're applying a field in a particular direction, we would start off with our domain pattern like so. We have this closure loop. And then as we apply the field in this particular direction, we will end up um, preferring certain directions of the magnetic moments. Um, and uh, eventually some of these domains will win out. And then eventually the moments, the, those domains will start, the, the magnetic moments in them will all start to rotate to get closer and closer to the applied field until at last we end up with all of the, all of the domain walls gone and the magnetic moment applied parallel to the, to the field, or the magnetic moment lies parallel to the applied field. So this picture here would be a point that is exactly on this dotted line, which is meant to represent the saturated magnetization. So as we move along this particular curve, we move through these different domain states. Okay, so if you uh, actually do small angle neutron scattering experiments, of what is happening um, in a material. So this is the magnetization curve, like I just showed you, um, for nanocrystalline cobalt. So cobalt uh, has a, is a ferromagnet, and um, you can make uh, you can make nanocrystalline samples that where the, the average grain size is, is reasonably well controlled. So in this case, it's about ten nanometers for the grain size. And um, and then if you do that. Um, and you compare what you see in the small angle neutron scattering experiment as you move around this, um, as you move along the, these fields, then what you'll see is that here, basically, there should be very little difference between uh, the uh, orange star and the pink triangle. Um, and 
in fact what you can see is that as you're moving up you do see changes so these changes here are expected to be due to the uh to the domain scattering um and the so due to the scattering from the domain walls but also from the different contributions from the overall moment orientation of the different domains and then when you get in principle to this point here then you might expect that in this case, all of the magnetic moments are pointing in the same direction. That means that there is no more magnetic contrast um, because everything is doing the same thing. And therefore you would expect to have a diminished um, magnetic scattering. Um, now that here you have to think about the direction in which you are applying your given magnetic field. So if I'm applying my magnetic field um, parallel to the to the to the neutron beam uh, then I will uh, then everything in my detector should uh, basically behaving be behaving in the same way if I apply my magnetic field in a different direction then I may might expect to get some differences between the vertical and the horizontal directions as we discussed uh, as we discussed yesterday okay so in this particular case you can see small changes you can see changes smoothly as you uh, as you move up in field. But then uh, the difference between the 243 millitesla and the 1800 millitesla is perhaps larger than we might have expected if we just relied on the magnetization information, because it would seem that we would expect only a very small difference. And so this is a common issue when uh, carrying out, uh, when looking at the behavior of, uh, when using small angle neutron scattering to study to study the behavior of this, we basically see see a lot more changes than we're sensitive to in the uh, in the magnetization, and so that brings into question the idea of whether we can really use this as a background. So what, when I said that if we're looking at this, there is no magnetic contrast. What I uh, am implicitly interested in doing is using using this as a means as something that I can then subtract off all of the rest of this data. To, to get information about the magnetic component only, because I want to try to make the assumption that what I see here is just the nuclear, is just the, the nuclear behavior, the nuclear small angle neutron scattering. And then ideally I would subtract off all of this, subtract this from all of the others, and then I would have my um, magnetic scattering. But because I see these changes here, it does, and indeed, if you keep on going, you'll still see some small changes. It does uh, bring into question how high in field you have to go to actually be achieving, to be actually be able to use this as a background. So, yes. So as it says here, the neutron can see transverse deviations in the magnetization long after the magnetic magnetization measurements are giving you no further information. So one way to get around this, there are, there are several ways to get around this. One of those ways is with polarization analysis, because that gives you a very clear indication of what you are seeing. Um, but as I mentioned yesterday, this can cause problems with the, well, it reduces your flux. Um, so uh, I'm going to give an example of applying as large a field as you can with the field parallel to the beam and using this to give you a contrast-free background. So why put the field parallel to the beam? So the idea is that then QX and QY should behave in the same, uh, behave, same way. And therefore you can carry out a radial averaging of the data and that will improve your statistics on that data. And you don't have to worry about including any angular corrections, which you might do in the case. So yesterday I showed you an example of magnetite um, and there you have to include a trigonometric correction to be able to handle the data correctly. If you're looking away from the strict true vertical and strict true horizontal. So, um, if you do that, so this is taking, uh, this is basically taking these nanocrystalline cobalt systems and applying as large a field as is, uh, as is possible. Um, if you're wondering about the field values here, um, these might seem like strange values to have set. Um, and the reason that these are particularly odd values is due to the application of the demagnetization factor. So you may recall, I mentioned that yesterday you have to take into account the demagnetization factor associated with the shape of your particles. 
Um, so in uh, this case, the field applied in for this here was 16 Tesla. Um, but after application of the demagnetization factor, that is an effective field experienced by the particles of 14.71 Tesla. And similarly, for all of these others, um, they correspond to uh, they correspond to uh, more um, intuitive numbers that you would have applied the field at before making the correction. Okay, so what we can see here is that uh, we're going through a particular, we're looking at the, uh, so on the right, you can see the magnetization as a function of field with the various points measured. And uh, as you can see, 15 Tesla, 14.7 Tesla is uh, an order of magnitude, well, it's significantly larger than uh, the other fields applied. So the hope is that this really is getting rid of everything and that this can be used as a true contrast measurement um, so that you can extract the, um, the magnetic information from what's being seen from what's being seen here. So we have all of the individual fields illustrated here and then the idea is to subtract is to subtract this information off um, and um, in these pictures this has all been uh, normalized so that it can so it has all been corrected so, and reduced so that one has absolute units um, for the small angle uh, cross section. And um, this is what the subtractions look like if we subtract off the orange high field data. So you can now see that uh, uh, that basically we are reproduce we are getting a similar pattern, um, a similar type of shape of pattern qualitatively with some changes in the uh, in the apparent intensity as we increase the field. Okay, so there are a number of things you can do with this. This particular experiment, uh, the aim was to try to explore what was happening in the low Q region with the aim of uh, trying to see if there is some, something equivalent to the Guinea approximation that we can think about quantitatively when looking at magnetic materials. So I know you've already um, learned about the, uh, uh, the Guinea approximation. Um, in terms of thinking about the radius of gyration associated with a polymer or a, a particle, a particle size or shape. Um, and that is based on certain assumptions about sharp edges. And as I mentioned yesterday and uh, tried to mention just before now, in the case of our domains or magnetic structures, we don't really have sharp interfaces. Um, instead, we have uh, a relative, relatively uh, diffuse interfaces um, that take place over a particular length scale. And that length scale is set by the uh, strength of the magnetic interactions between, uh, between the individual magnetic moments. Um, and so uh, that uh, we, can, we can construct what's called a micromagnetic or magnetic exchange length, uh, which is basically this term here. So A here is the um, exchange constant for our particular, in this case, cobalt the exchange interaction, uh, so representing the strength of the exchange between, between, the, between the cobalt uh, moments. And it contains also the, 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 the saturation magnetization and a field component. Um, and so this is, a, this is a length scale. And basically we have to find a way to incorporate that length scale in and see if we can in fact, in a perfect case or in a, in a how do you call it? A, simple case, let's say, and see if we can actually uh, get something that looks a bit like the Guinea law. So, the, that's the, so the, these nanocrystalline cobalt systems are good for that because they have this uh, kind of well-controlled and particulate size. Um, and cobalt is pretty well understood as magnetic materials go. And so here, what has been done is, uh, so this is the data I originally showed you, and then one subtracts off the high field and you end up with the um, curves I showed you just before. So this is the uh, this is the this is the cross section um, against the wave vector. And so if we now plot the logarithm of that against q squared, then you can see we get these nice straight lines. Uh, there are so they're very well behaved here, and then we start to see very small de deviations up here as we get to, to lower fields. But basically, um, we can we can basically get a straight line in this uh, straight lines here when we uh, Apply the, when we apply these um, changes to the axes. And that means that indeed we can think about this as behaving in a, in a way similar to the Guinea approximation. But what we have to do is instead of just taking 
um, a radius of gyration based on the particle shape, we have to introduce an additional term relating to the magnetic exchange length. So this contribution here. Um, and so you can see, uh, so the, uh, the slope of these lines is used to get this, uh, this quantity, this R squared. And then this is plotted against uh, the uh, applied field um, to, give, uh, to give a straight line to show that indeed, in this case, we can in fact develop and show that we are seeing something like the Guinea law, but for magnetic materials, if we make the appropriate additions to the, um, uh, to incorporate the information about the magnetic interfaces. Okay, so um, that is uh, basically all that I have to say for the examples here. Um, and so I'll stop.